All right. So, slightly fashionably late. Let's start. Uh, I guess, um, I don't know if I'm supposed to do say whatever I'm supposed to say in Italian anyway. Uh, so, welcome to everybody for the, uh, for, uh, the 2022 uh, Vilfredo Pareto Lecture. Uh, Giovanni will, uh, will, will uh, do the introduction to the lecture as well as to the speaker. So I'm uh, here only as, uh, in the place of Giorgio Barba Navaretti, uh, the president of the Collegio, could not be here tonight uh, to welcome everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, and uh, in this, uh, I, you know, most of you probably have already seen this, uh, this room, but this is the first time we use it for a scientific lecture. So. I'm, uh, I'm happy to, to see that it's, uh, you know, it's looking very good also for, uh, for this kind of purposes. And uh, so welcome. And so let me just not take any more, uh, more time and thank Katrina for being here. And uh, I give a word, the floor to Giovanni. Okay, uh, so good, good, good evening, everybody. Let's see if this works. It does. Okay, so I'm uh, very happy to introduce Katrin Lurken today as our uh, distinguished Pareto speaker. Um, today, sort of as, as, a, as a tribute to, to Norwegian traditions and also, you know, given how productive uh, uh, Katrin is, and I will show you uh, she is, we even decided to turn off uh, the, air, the, 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 the heating system. and, and, and I hope it worked. I hope uh, that we all uh, wrote many, many papers today. You're welcome. All right, so let me say a few words about the Wilfredo uh, Pareto lectures. So these are lectures in economics and social sciences were delivered uh, by distinguished scholars to honor uh, Wilfredo Pareto. So we all know um, Wilfredo Pareto, of course, and, and we, we also uh, should know if we are here in this room that he has been an, an alumnus of the University of Torino and of the Politecnico has been a towering figure in the social sciences who has given uh, uh, fundamental contributions in economic sociology and political science. Now, um, Katrin Leuken is the last one of, a, of a, an impressive list of uh, economists uh, who, uh, have, uh, uh, and, and social sci scientists who have given uh, the lecture in, 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 in the, over the last 15 years. I thought, you know, last year we had uh, Gianluca Violante, the year before we had Blandel, uh, Gilboa, Udry, Goldberg, Pagano, and so on and so forth. Uh, I count uh, six Nobel Prize winners, and I'm sure that, in, you know, within this list there are uh, future Nobel Prize winners, so good luck on this, of course, Catherine, and, you know, <laughs> crossing fingers. Um, so let me tell you something about Katrin. Uh, um, what is impressive is, is, I mean, if you look at her CV, is the quick start. I mean, how quickly uh, she, she went from, uh, uh, from you know, being a PhD student, 2010 is when she finished at the University of Bergen to be a full professor. Four years later, she was a full professor uh, at the same university. Um, in 2013 is also when, when I think, when, when we first met, uh, she, uh, she was on maternity leave. I mean, just to, you know, to give some sort of uh, personal uh, uh, information, she was on maternity leave and, and I was there for, for a talk and, 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 and she wanted really to meet. And, and so we met at the cafe with, with her baby. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. So, but that's, that, was, uh, that, that was already impressive, I mean, I must say. Um, right now, she's professor of economics at the Norwegian School of Economics, which is also in Bergen, co-research director of uh, the Center of uh, Empirical Labor Economics since 2017, and, and principal investigator of, a, 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 again, another center. I think this, that's the good thing of Norway. They have a lot of centers because they, they have good research money, I guess. Um, but, but, but more, more on this, more, more uh, you know, amazing uh, sort of uh, goals she, she managed to achieve. Uh, she's currently a principal uh, investigator of an ERC starting grant on uh, criminality, victimization, and social interactions. Um, I think she will talk uh, uh, on, on, on this topic uh, today. Uh, she's also a research fellow at CPR, IZA, CESIFO. Uh, professor two, which I'm not sure what it means, but uh, it sounds good, you know, you can be professor one and two uh, at the University of Bergen and, and also at Statistics Norway. 
Another personal uh, uh, news, I hope I can say it, she's, uh, she's uh, on the board of editors of the Review of Economic Studies, and today she had a spare hour uh, here at the Collegio, and, and she, 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 you know, she used that extra hour to do an editorial decision, and I know about this because I was uh, the referee. Uh, and, and you know, this is just to, to mention how, how devoted she is to this profession, to this, and, and, and that's a public good, you know, in sort of in the sense of Wilfredo Pareto, I guess. Uh, um, she has been awarded the Niels uh, Klim Prize in 2017, which is a very important prize in, in you know, uh, for Nordic, young Nordic scholars within law, humanities, and social sciences. It's a very competitive uh, uh, award. In terms of uh, topics. Um, we are talking about the research uh, agenda, wide research agenda that is based on Nor uh, Norwegian administrative records, sort of the, uh, you know, the dream uh, data. Uh, um, and and within, within, within these uh, uh, data, she, she has looked at many, many different things. She has looked at early investments in children. I should mention she knows a lot about this because she has three children. Um, she has looked at long-term outcomes uh, of, of, of different social policies. Um, always sort of with a focus on identifying causal effects, sort of, you know, uh, uh, top class uh, empirical work uh, on policies that, that also in Italy uh, are very much discussed in, 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 in politics right now, like parental leave, subsidized day, daycare, father's quota in leave and, 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 and cash subsidies for families. Now, more recently, and, and that's going to be the topic of today's talk, uh, she has, um, uh, worked on causal effects of incarceration on, on recidivism, labor market outcomes, but I think more generally on well-being, um, which uh, 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 is, is, is some amazing work. In part, uh, also worked, she has worked with um, Manudi Buller and Magne Mokstad. I think that was the first paper they worked on, uh, a JPE uh, uh, paper of a few years ago. Uh, we, we saw some of this uh, work, for example, we saw Lara Corey's work uh, uh, here at the college a year, uh, a year ago that is co-authored with, uh, with Katrin. Now, all this work has led to an impressive publication record. If you think that, I, I, you know, I, one should, shouldn't say the, the age of, 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 of women, but I mean, she was born in 1983, so she is less than 40 years old and has already uh, uh, published in leading economic journals. I, this morning I counted 18 journals. So I don't know if that number has changed by now. Um, top uh, uh, journals, American Economic Review, Journal of Political Economy, and so on and so forth. Not just that, uh, she has also disseminated her work, which is typically something we, we, we do, we, we as economists do very little. Uh, which I think is very important, uh, you know, for, for, for our research to, to have sort of also a say in, 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 uh, in, poli in the policy uh, domain, like, for example, the Atlantic, Free Economics, uh, the Harvard Business Review. And she's also uh, been working as an op-ed columnist for uh, something like the Financial Times of, uh, of Norway. Okay, so with uh, uh, no further ado, uh, I would uh, leave uh, the floor to Katrin. We are very happy to have you. Uh, thank you very much for that nice introduction. Uh, and thank you so much for, for asking me to do this. It's a big honor to, to be asked and uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, so, I thought about what I would talk to, talk to you about today and, and decided to talk to you about my kind of more recent uh, research agenda on, on this um, kind of effects of, of prison and think about policies to reintegrate former inmates into the labor force. I will, labor force is maybe a little bit uh, kind of, uh, I, will, I will be a little bit wider and think about kind of society also on other dimension like health and so on, but I'll come back, back to this. Um, so just to have a bit of background for, for uh, the question. So today I will focus a lot on the policy angle, but I will also, of course, back up my claims with, with research. Uh, but the background here is, uh, is kind of from, from policy. And there in, if you look at all countries almost, incarceration rates have risen dramatically. Uh, so I'll show you a graph very soon where you see that the US is a big outlier with very high rates. But also in Europe, rates have uh, been doubling um, uh, the last 20, 30 years. Uh, 
Uh, and both the levels, but also this kind of increases, raise important questions about consequences of, of prison. Um, so do they return to a life of crime after prison? Uh, or do they re successfully re-enter the labor market? Uh, what about their health? Uh, does it deteriorate after prison? Or can prison actually help to improve their, their health? Um, and given this, uh, which policies in or maybe also after prison helps to reintegrate former inmates into the uh, society? So first we need to understand if prison can actually work at all. Uh, and then we have to think about the policies uh, that can make it work. So it's, it's kind of a daunting question, and I don't have the perfect answer today, but hopefully I'll give you a little bit of background of where, of where we are in research on this and a and, um, and little bit of ideas on how to think about uh, these questions. Uh, so this is just to back that first claim that I had now in the previous slide. Uh, so here you have the blue here is uh, the incarceration rates in, in the US. Uh, and if you go back to the 1980s, uh, it was still much higher in the US than in Europe, which is the other lines. And then uh, you see that it increased a lot in the 90, uh, 80s and 90s. And it has flattened more, if anything, gone down a little bit in the US, but it's still very, very high. Uh, and if you look at this graph, you see the Western Europe average I have here and, and Norway, uh, as Norway will be kind of important for some of the research today, I also have Norway. And, and in, in general, it's much, much lower, but it has actually doubled since 1980s also in, um, also in, this, uh, in these countries. So how do we think about prison uh, and effects of prison? Uh, so if you think about uh, some theoretical pre prediction of how prison could uh, help reintegrate inmates, uh, there, there could both be very positive effects of, of prison, uh, so in the sense that it, it could rehabilitate or help the prisoners, and it could be negative effect of, of prisons that makes uh, the reintegration to society harder. Um, so some mechanisms for why it could be positive could be through rehabilitation efforts or uh, help them uh, kind of on a new path which will be a lot of the focus of, of today's talk, to think about how to, to improve rehabilitation. But it could also be more like specific deterrence effects, like you're scared out of uh, prison, or the prison actually deter you from committing crime. And this might be a very important mechanism that I will not talk a lot about today, but that has been very important research on, and it, it's related, so I'll come back to it a little bit. So. Uh, on the more negative side, we, the, there, there are, for example, human capital depreciation, where you are out, out of the labor force or out of your educational career or something. So this could be a, an issue if you, if, you're not, if you have to disrupt these, uh, these processes. Uh, you can have employment uh, discrimination because you have been to prison. Uh, I'll come back to that. And you can have these kind of mechanisms that, if anything, bringing you in with other criminals together and form it could lead to some of these peer effects that now you might meet tougher criminals and commit more or more hardened crimes after because you build a network of criminals in prison. And this mechanism has also been studied and shown that indeed takes place in, in some parts, the types of prisons. So. Uh, so there is a lot of kind of mechanisms uh, going on, and I think uh, it's fair to say that there is likely very heterogeneous effects across different uh, countries. Uh, so we, I don't think we think that prison has one effect that is homogeneous. Uh, and that's because we have very different prison systems uh, and very different focus on rehabilitation in different countries. Um, we have, might have very different prison populations, and this is something we and others have looked into, and I just write here not so much, so I won't talk that much about that. And that's a little bit because in almost all countries, actually, prison populations are always kind of low educated, they very detached from the labor market, they have very high prevalence of mental health issues and so on. And they, the kind of distributional type of crimes, so violent crimes uh, in, uh, and, and um, uh, drug-related crimes and so on, are not that dissimilar across uh, uh, especially the countries I will talk about today, which is mostly Europe and, and the US. Uh, and finally, of course, uh, when we talk about reintegration and rehabilitation, uh, the flexibility in the labor markets, access to social security on the other side, access to healthcare and these type of um, 
societal or institutions might be very important. So it might not help that much if the prison put in a lot of resources on rehabilitation, and when you come out, there is nothing to kind of absorb the new knowledge that you have from an education program or labor market program because no one wants to employ you anyway or, or things like that. So the flexibility or the kind of how, the, how we set up the labor market for, for this population is also very, uh, can be very important. So I'll touch about, uh, upon all these different, uh, uh, different differences uh, a little bit later. Uh, but first, in this lecture, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the research uh, we have done um, uh, in Norway to both to get an understanding of how, is it for, how can you identify these type of effects uh, and how can they look at. And I'll, exp I'll, I'll compare this to research from, um, from other countries also. So, uh, so just to, why is it challenging to kind of estimate these effects of prison or uh, reintegration effects? Uh, uh, and I think uh, uh, there has been many kind of, uh, um, a lot of research and criminology uh, on this going back, uh, but very much it's very correlational. You kind of try to, try to uh, control for things that are different between uh, those going to prison and those not going to prison. Uh, and in general, it's really hard because it's a lot of unobserved uh, differences between this, uh, this population. Uh, and I think it's kind of, well, in 2009 especially, I think we know more today, but then very little was known about the effects of imprisonments on, for example, reoffending or, uh, or labor market uh, outcome. Um, and there were kind of two big challenges. Uh, so one is data availability. Uh, so you need to really follow then this population before and after, uh, and you need to observe their labor market outcomes and their uh, criminal records, uh, and if you also want to look at their health, you need observations on their health, which I'll come back to, and so on. Uh, and the second is this uh, idea of correlated unobservables. So, so what drove them to actually do the crime? What makes them different, uh, the prison population, from other? And this, this is a, um, a, a problem in all empirical work, uh, uh, I think. Uh, but in prison, it's especially a problem because they are very uh, negatively selected on, on observation, on education and uh, income, and then this, this detachment uh, of the labor market. Uh, so in this talk, I'll kind of do three things. Uh, I'll try to use this research from Norway as an example of causal effects of prison on especially three dimensions, uh, recidivism, so probability of committing more crime uh, on your employment uh, and on, uh, on some health uh, dimensions. Uh, and this is especially then based on the papers that Giovanni already uh, talked about. Uh, this is Biller, Dahl, and Mogsta, which is published in JP in 2020, and we have a new working paper with Laura Corey and Mandy Biller on the, on the health dimension. Uh, and then I'll try to compare to research from uh, other countries. Uh, and then I'll discuss some different policies, kind of in an eye to the success of the Norwegian prison system. So I already tell, tell you now that we'll find kind of some positive uh, rehabilitation effects uh, and also all these other related uh, research. Uh, yes. Okay, so the two methods we, will, we used or have been using for kind of causal identification in this setting, so to really try to get at the causal effect of prison and control for all these differences is you know, ob an observable is to two different methods. So the first we have used is kind of an instrumental variable method, and here we exploit that judges are randomly assigned to criminal uh, cases in the Norwegian system. Um, uh, and the second method that we will uh, uh, have been using is more kind of um, traditional event studies where we exploit uh, random timing of entering prison, conditional on prison sentence. So for the same type of, of, um, uh, of crime or, or sentence, uh, the timing of when you enter prison uh, can be quite random within maybe not too long uh, time uh, windows. So I'll give you much more uh, intuition for this uh, these instruments now. Uh, so this ex random assignment of criminal cases to judge judges, you can think of a very simple example. 
Uh, so suppose that half of judges always incarcerate. So all the cases they see, they, pu they put you in prison. And the other half never incarcerates. So they will always uh, give you an alternative punishment uh, or uh, let you go free. Um, and if judges then are randomly assigned, which is the case here, uh, then it's like a coin flip for whether a defendant will be incarcerated. So if you meet a, randomly meet a judge, half of the time you will be incarcerated and half of the time you will not. Uh, and this is of course not the case, uh, so that would be very extreme. Uh, but this is the same variation we are using because some judges have a higher uh, tendency to incarcerate for the same type of crime. Uh, and there has been a lot of literature that tries to explain why this is the case. It seems to be a combination of biases and more like a judge fixed effect on coming in with a higher propensities. And there is many, and we are not really looking into that in our paper because we don't know that much about uh, the characteristics of the judges, but we use this variation uh, as an instrument for whether you uh, go to prison or not. Uh, so this measure of judge stringency is then the average incarceration rate in all the cases that a judge sees, except for your case. Uh, so the variation goes, for example, from some judges, uh, when you have seen 500 cases, incarcerate uh, about 60% um, of the cases they see, or the people they see, uh, and the kind of less strict judge would incarcerate only 30%. So that's the variation we, we think about. It's never zero and 100, but it goes from 30 to 60, which is a huge range for the same type of cases. Right? Uh, and we don't see that this is correlated with observable case characteristics. So there is nothing that, it seems to really be random which cases you see. It's not like those that incarcerate more see more immigrants, more males, uh, and things that could be correlated with incarcerating more. Uh, so in the paper and, and in a more kind of classic talk, I would talk a lot about assumptions and tests associated with this type of instrument. Uh, and I will not go into a lot of, of details uh, here today. So if you're interested, you can, you can look at the paper and, and we can talk uh, more about that later, of course. So I just wanted to show you one table, which is this testing of the random assignment, because I think this is really starkly showing you that there is just nothing that... Uh, uh, that is correlated with this uh, judge stringency measure. Uh, so on the kind of left side here, you see a lot of demographics and type of crime of the, of the defendant. Uh, so their age, whether it's a female, foreign born, number of children, high school, and so on, and all the different type of crimes. And we also have their employment history, whether they have been charged before, and so on. Uh, and then we look at whether these characteristics uh, predict whether you get uh, in, in prison in general. And here we see, a, uh, see that they do, right? that it's very correlated with prison. Uh, so if you're older, you go more to prison. If you're female, you go less to prison. So all of these things, uh, th things kick in. Uh, but then when we look at this judge stringency measure, the, the, whether the judge is, is, is stricter or not, it's not correlated with all of these things. Uh, so that's what I said. So the judges do not see different type of cases. They see the same uh, cases. So I can say that the institutional details are like that, but it's really nice that you can also show this in the, in the data. Okay. And then the second uh, type of results that I'll show you are using um, more like uh, event study uh, framework. And this is uh, the kind of random timing of entering prison conditional on, on, uh, on being in this, having the same type of uh, sentence or crime. Uh, and just to have the intuition for this uh, too, think about um, a very simple example where you have two similar offenders uh, doing the same type of crime, but one entered prison in 2008 and one entered in 2010. Um, uh, and the idea here then is that the 2010 entry can serve as a control group for the outcomes for the 2008 entry until they enter prison themselves. Uh, so then they are no longer a valid control because now they of course go to prison and will get all the effects of, of prison uh, themselves. So, uh, and the key assumption of this is that you have parallel trends before entering uh, prison. So you have to show that the 2008 and 2010 entry follow the same trends in outcomes in the years prior to 2008. 
So for example, if you look at employment, they follow the same trends until one of them go to prison, and then we can see what are the effects of prison comparing to what would have happened if you did not go to, to prison. Uh, there are several assumptions and tests with event study designs also. It's not as random or pure as the uh, uh, um, judge uh, design because the judges are really randomly assigned, and here it's not completely random. Like It's, it's, it's something about the timing uh, uh, that's a bit harder. Uh, but it's really nice because you can show these kind of patterns in the data, so, it's, uh, so you can show that uh, how, how these things uh, evolve. I'll show you this. So I'll come to some of the findings now. So for this uh, judge, uh, um, random assignment of judge uh, instrument, uh, we find in this uh, Norwegian context um, that uh, prison uh, leads to um, or discourage further criminal behavior up to five years after, after prison. Uh, and it also reduced the number of, of crimes. Um, so it, this is not only an incapacitation effect, it's not only when they are in prison, uh, it's for many years after they enter uh, society. And this we can show in some, some figures. Uh, so this figure, for example, is so zero would be the month of the decision where the judge either assigned prison or alternative uh, punishment. Uh, and here, so this is kind of the difference between those going to prison and those not going to prison at the margin. Uh, and in the beginning, they are zero because they are randomly assigned, so they are identical. Uh, and then you see that the differences in whether they would commit a crime or ever be charged. Uh, uh, declines over time, and even five years after, it's a big difference in uh, whether they commit a crime or not, depending on whether they went to prison in time zero. Uh, and most of the prisoners here, which I will come back to, would only be in prison for less than one year. Uh, so five years after, everyone is out of prison uh, because of this, uh, this policy, or this, uh, because of that initial uh, crime. Uh, so another way to show it, um, which maybe is nicer actually, it's just harder to do for the probability of committing a crime, but this is for number of charges. So how many times will you be charged for a crime? Uh, and at the same time here, so the lower black line is the compliers, so that's those that uh, went to prison because they got a strict judge. Uh, and the like, like, grayer line uh, is the compliers, if, so those that did not go to prison because they met a less strict uh, judge. Mm. And they start off the same way, and then the, those that go to prison, they don't commit any crime the first uh, year uh, because they are in prison, so it's, it's difficult. But then when they come out, they also are on a very low a trend, and, and while they commit a little bit of crime, even five years after, they've only on average committed three, been charged three, three times. So what are the counterfactual? What would have happened if they did not go to prison? They would have gone back to life, started doing crime almost immediately, uh, and after five years, they would have committed something like uh, 13 uh, charges or 13 different uh, crimes. So it's a big difference between those that go to prison and those that do not go to, to prison. Uh, and then we move on to think a little bit about why this is the case. Uh, so why do you find this uh, big effect on, on, uh, on charge? Uh, and what we find here is that the reduction in crime that we see is driven by individuals that were not working prior to incarceration. So they were not attached to the labor market at all. Uh, so among those that were not employed, uh, we find that prison increased their participation in job market training programs. Um, it raised employment and earnings and discouraged criminal behavior. So it's kind of the joint probability of all these three that increases uh, a lot. Uh, and if you look at those that were previously employed, uh, prison reduced employment actually because they, they lose their job, some, some lose their job when they go to prison. Uh, and we don't see much on, on criminal uh, behavior. Uh, so it seems to this rehabilitation mechanism goes in the Norwegian prison system in this period really goes through the, this labor market training and the fact that they get the job seems to be really important. Uh, 
so this we could also see in this type, same type of figures. Um, so the column A is for those that were previously employed, and here you just see this reduction in um, uh, uh, in whether I think I went to the, yeah this was first for the for the crime. So those that were previously employed, we don't see any significant effect on their probability of being charged five years after. And for those, those that were previously non-employed, we see this big uh, effect that's lost also five years uh, after. And the same for employment for the same groups. Uh, so for those that were previously employed, you see this big reduction or large reduction in probability of being employed. Uh, and those that were previously non-employed enter the labor market and are much more likely to have a job five years after uh, than, the, than the other ones. So. so these were for recidivism and, uh, and labor market outcomes. Uh, and then we kind of continued to do another project to think more about the health um, of, of, uh, of, of uh, inmates and, and uh, uh, kind of think about whether health is an important uh, dimension to, to explore, both for rehabilitation purposes, but also whether there are uh, other uh, effects on health that are important that might not be the same as uh, for the same population as the, uh, the ones we looked at for, for labor market outcomes and crimes. Uh, uh, and what do we find here? So, we, we, here we mainly use these event study methods because you don't have a lot of precision when you look at health outcomes. Uh, but here we find that prisons also improve defendants' mental health. Uh, and about 30% uh, decrease in the probability of mental health we sit five years uh, after prison. So it's, really, it's a large effect, like it's much better mental health. Uh, and also here we see that prison uh, that affects last and maybe even deepens post-release. So it's not only when they are in prison, it's also after, after prison. Uh, and we also see that these improvements are bigger if you are in prisons with milder conditions and more focus on rehabilitation. So here we can do a lot more heterogeneity because of this, the design we have for the method. Uh, and this type of milder condition and rehabilitation efforts are really important. I'll come back to this when we talk about policies. Uh, uh, and just two small notes for this. So while lower precision, we also find that uh, the average positive effect on mental health is there with the same IV specification as I just showed you for employment and, and health. Um, and if anything, the health effect is larger for previously employed. So it does not seem to be the fact that we only see these positive effects of prison for the non-employed population. It's just that the non-employed population, it was really important um, a crime and employment effects going through the labor market training. But here it seems to maybe be some, a different story that it, that it, if anything, maybe it's more important for the adults that for another type of population inmates which are previously employed and maybe it goes more on the uh, health dimension which is, might be very different from the employment training uh, program. And this is one way to illustrate the findings for mental health. So this is an event study where on the y-axis I have the probability of having a mental health diagnosis. Uh, and then you have the months uh, before and after the, the case decision of prison. And you see that before there is not that much difference between those that go to prison and those that do not go to prison in time zero. Uh, and after there is a big difference. Um, uh, and this seems to be that you're much, much less likely to have a mental health diagnosis in the months after you go to prison, uh, and five years after you still have much, much fewer mental health uh, diagnoses uh, than before. Uh, this was mental health, so we also show that this is not the case for physical health. Uh, so while there are not that much differences before, the physical health uh, diagnosis also goes down a little bit while in prison, but then they just revert back when you come out of prison and uh, stay on the same, more or less the same path as, as before. So it really seems to be related to the mental health aspects uh, and not that much the physical, uh, physical health. Uh, so why do we see this uh, health? Um, so this is, uh, so it's really hard to measure health. So I didn't, I don't have time to talk a lot about that. But um, 
this is measure, measured as uh, healthcare utilization. So it's whether you go to your, uh, your, your, the doctor or the special care system and get the diagnosis for mental health. Uh, so it could be that this is just like um, demand driven and, an and, and not really an improvement in health. It's just that they use the health services more or less, less in this case. Uh, uh, and one kind of plausible explanation for that could be that prison actually weaken institutional trust, so you stop going to the, uh, to the doctor or something like that. Uh, uh, but I think we have a lot of evidence in, in our work that this is not the case, case in Norway. So they usually use the healthcare sector quite a lot, also prior to the crime. So there is no sign that they are, they are not attached to the, uh, to the healthcare uh, sector. Um, they use it much more than the general population, like more than double. Uh, so it's um, uh, so, so so it's and it's very low cost, so they, that's why they use it. Uh, then I'll come back to this very soon. But the Norwegian prisons kind of have a relatively humane prison conditions and equal rights to public health services. Uh, so you don't really have this institutional um, trust uh, issue, I think. Uh, we don't see this decrease in physical health visits. So if it's institutional trust, it must be then only related to mental health. Um, and finally, we see some decrease in emergency visits and mental health emergency visits. And these are better capture changes in health rather than demand effects, because you don't plan this type of emergency uh, visits. Uh, finally, we also find in this paper additional evidence of improvement in family well-being. Uh, so also the spouses improve their mental health. Uh, we also see some um, uh, uh, positive effects for children. So all of this kind of really speaks to the uh, environment being better uh, for, for both the um, uh, inmate or ex-convict and, and, and his family or her family. It's mostly mental. Okay. <coughs> okay. Uh, so I think our study, or especially the first, but maybe a little bit the second, oh, has been kind of a little bit of a proof of concept that time spent in prison with a focus on rehabilitation can be preventive. Uh, so this was kind of in contrast to a widely embraced Notting Works uh, um, doctrine that has been extremely influential in the US in particular, but also in some European countries. Um, and there has not been much research that shows that, that that prison can improve um, uh, labor market uh, recidivism and health outcomes. Uh, uh, but that was 10 years, almost 10 years ago now, and, uh, and now it's been more, very, coming more research, uh, and I think uh, more that kind of speaks to some of these rehabilitation efforts that I will try to, to, to give you a brief uh, overview of now. Uh, so often research from other countries are, much, are more mixed uh, and often there are more smaller and non-representative samples. So in that sense, I, we looked at the whole prison populations of Norway, and in the US it's usually for one prison or one state or something like that. Uh, but with, with that in mind, uh, studies uh, that kind of find a positive reintegration effect, um, it would typically be in similar countries than Norway. So there has been some studies in Sweden that confirms this, this effect, for example. Um, the, it could be because they have similar prison institutions. Uh, for example, some prisons that have more open uh, focus on having more open and less security or more focus on rehabilitation efforts. Uh, or re there are some studies that find positive effects of prison because you reduce length of sentences in the US. Um, uh, and I think uh, a related research that I'll speak to a little bit is also research on kind of post-release programs and what they, what they show. Uh, uh, finally, before I kind of go into more details on the, on the papers, there is a lot of related papers that I will not discuss today that study the uh, role of the turns, for example, these mechanisms that you're scared kind of um, out of prison. Uh, in, more on the incapacitation effect, like whether do you... Uh, uh, whether the effects comes from the time you spent in prison, and um, more on this peer effects so spillovers uh, and so and so on. And this is a little bit more to tie, tie it to the reintegration uh, and rehabilitation part uh, for time. Uh, it's not because this is not very interesting. Uh. Okay, uh, so I think uh, I'll, there are there are other studies, but I, I chose a few that I think are very. Um, 
and very related to this rehabilitation effort. Uh, so there is one paper from Italy by uh, Giovanni and his co-author uh, that look at um, a transfer from closed to open prison uh, that was like an exogenous change to, uh, to the prison condition. So it's, I think it's the, the paper that has the most best causal effect of, a, of, a, of the condition of, of prison, not whether you go to prison or not, but whether you change the condition. Um, and they find that a more open prison with lower security and more focus on rehabilitation reduce uh, recidivism. Uh, in Sweden, there is a paper by uh, Jalmarsson and Lindquist that shows that more time in prison, so this is not on the extensive margin, but more on the intensive margin, uh, decreases mortality risk post-release. Uh, so it shows that prison can also have positive health effects on mortality in the Swedish context, because if you sp spend more time in prison, you got more access to your rehabilitation um, your programs and so on. Uh, the increased time is not increasing it to, to several years. It was mostly on a few months, month, monthly, uh, months basis. Uh, and Denmark, in a study from Denmark, also uh, finds, finds this, where they increased the, the length of sentence for violent offenders. Um, and they also found some reductions in unemployment and, and increased earnings because of, of this time in prison and links that to rehabilitation efforts. Um, so here you saw some evidence that for similar countries than Norway or from uh, this more open prison uh, rehabilitation um, kind of setting, you can, you can find uh, this type of uh, positive effects on, on recidivism and employment also in other, other contexts. Uh, so there is not a lot more research in Europe, unfortunately, yet. I hope it will be becoming much more. I think that's a little bit linked to this data issue that I brought up uh, earlier in the talk. So it's still really hard to link um, um, uh, this type of inmate or prison data to, to labor market outcomes and, and recidivism and so on. But in the US, it's been quite a lot. It's, it's many uh, issues in the US with data too, but for some reason they have been able to do some very good uh, work on, on linking prison data or, uh, um, or, um, or this type of uh, criminal law, law data to, to labor market outcomes and recidivism. Uh, and this is never for the whole of the US, it's always for like uh, one prison or one state or one, um, uh, yeah, parts of it. Uh, and here they have kind of the earlier papers uh, typically shows negative effects of, of, of prisons in, in the US. Either they find no effect on uh, on labor market outcomes, or they find a negative effect, uh, either for juveniles in the Iser and Doyle paper, or for a more like adult population in the Miller-Smith uh, paper. Uh, so a little bit more new research um, uh, actually finds a little bit the opposite. So Norris et al. find a negative effect on mortality during incarceration, but that's more like an incapacitation effect. And, but then we find no effect post-release, so at least not negative. Uh, and this Rosen Shemto paper in JP in 2021 actually finds some positive effects on recidivism of reducing length of sentences in the US. So here it comes to uh, more the reducing the length. So I just showed you some research that increasing the length was positive, and here reducing the length is positive. Uh, but here they reduce length from really long sentences, uh, while in the Nordic model, they, it's, it might even be good to increase the length a little bit because then they get more access to programs and so on. So it's very different settings uh, to think about, think about that. Um, what about post-release programs? Uh, so here there are typically not a lot of research. It's quite mixed findings, mostly from the US. Some find some positive effects, no effect, even negative effects and so on. So there is hard to find uh, clear patterns of these type of uh, programs. Uh, and I borrowed this from Giovanni, but one, um, one thing that could, uh, could be the reason that it's hard to do this training post-release, like when you're out in the society again, uh, it could be that you, uh, you compete with all the linguist habits that you have, like that it's, you, you go back to your old network, or so it's really hard to now get the 
inmates to meet up in the morning and so on. So when you are in prison, you can really control their time. Like you can force them to, to, to get up at eight in the morning, force them to go on to the programs and so on. When they are out in society, it's really hard to enforce any of these, uh, uh, these, uh, these take-ups. Uh, and that's, I think it's a little bit related to a more general um, and very big literature on job market training programs targeting young populations at risk. So you could think that you could target this population before they commit crime or go to prisons and so on. Um, and usually these active labor market policies, for, especially for this population, does not find much effects or very small effects. Uh, so it's really hard, uh, because, probably because of, of, uh, of the enforcement, but uh, there is still research, I think, to be done uh, on, this, uh, on this part. Yes, so that was more or less the, the research part on, on thinking about rehabilitation and what we know about uh, rehabilitation. Uh, uh, and then I, the rest of the talk, I wanted to talk, kind of go, you think a little bit about uh, what does it mean to be incarcerated in the Norwegian setting where I have most evidence. Compare that a little bit to the other countries that I, I mentioned. And then think a little bit about policies that we could adopt to, to learn a little bit from the uh, from the settings where we find the positive effects. Uh, so what does it actually mean to be incarcerated in Norway, for example? Uh, so the prison condition will typically be what we call relatively humane. Uh, so of course you lose the lack of freedom, which is a big deal. So prison is never kind of an... Um, easy institution in, some, in that sense. Uh, but they try to have a principle of normality within prison. Uh, so life inside shall resemble life outside as much as possible. And offenders shall be placed in the lowest possible security regime. Uh, so the idea is that you, uh, of course, based on the severity of the crime, uh, you cannot always go to a very low security prison, but as m far as possible, try to use uh, uh, the lowest security you can. Uh, and then you also have a progression towards reintegration. So low level offenders go directly to these open prisons with low security. That's about one third of the prisons. Um, and then more serious offenders start in closed prisons and that's about two thirds uh, of prisons. Uh, they usually move to open before release to have a reintegration uh, kind of idea. Uh, so that kind of number, whether one third of prisons should be open, is not, uh, is, uh, I don't think it's, uh, I think that's open for discussion, uh, but that, that's the highest number in, in Europe at least. Most countries would have much fewer. They, they are, there are some that have, but most countries would have much fewer open uh, prisons. Um, so what about programs in prisons? So all prisons offer education, mental health and training programs. So about 30 to 40 percent of inmates uh, would participate in some type of educational program. Uh, if you're not enrolled in this program, you will typically work e either within prison and some work also outside, but, but that's a very small number. Uh, and in this period, 80, 20 percent participated in a drug-related program. Just to have some examples, it's not everyone, like there could be many constraints on, on mental and physical health that makes people not participate but a lot of them participate. Uh, uh, they're typically small prisons. You don't really have the overcrowding issue that you can see in, in some other countries. Uh, we would have about 60 prisons across the country and you would typically have one prisoner per cell. Uh, uh, and what does this cost? Uh, so Norway has a relatively large budget per prisoner. Uh, so you would pay about $118,000 per prisoner. I think this was in 2017, but that's probably not very dissimilar today. Mm -hmm. And just to have some comparison countries on that, uh, Sweden and other Nordic countries would also have a budget uh, that is similar. Um, in Europe, the average would be uh, about half. Uh, in the US, it's about one fourth. Italy, where we are now, would be about the average in Europe. Uh, Portugal would be very low, so there, it, it, there is a lot of variation also in in Europe, and even in the U US, New York is much higher uh, than Alabama, and New York City is extremely high. Right? 
Uh, and much of this difference is due to the labor cost, actually. So if you, do, if you ac account for the differences in wages across countries, there is not that big differences anymore. Uh, so that's an important uh, part of it. Uh, so what does it mean to be incarcerated when it comes to this health dimension? Um, so in the Norwegian system, you, prisons could serve as a gateway to access public health care. Um, so you have like kind of what you call an import model. Uh, so all the crucial services for reintegration is delivered to the prison uh, by service providers. So you would get medical uh, services uh, and you would get like health care, maternity care, emergency medicine, uh, social, mental, and medical rehabilitation, dental care, and, and so on. Uh, and you also have a psychotherapist per 100 inmates, so it's, you can also get help with mental health uh, problems on top of prison staff and health workers. That can also be trained in some of these uh, addiction and mood disorders and, and so on. Uh, so how long are these inmates in, in prison? Uh, so in Norway, typical prison time is similar to most other OECD countries. So the average length would be about eight months um, uh, for all types of, of crimes. And 90% of inmates would stay in prison for less than one year. Uh, so when we think about those that serve very long sentences, it's a very small handful of, of, the, of the inmates. Uh, uh, you would be eligible for parole typically after two-thirds of the sentence is, is served. Um, and in the, just as a uh, kind of outlier, the U.S. is much longer. But they have almost three years on average, uh, so it's, uh, it's a big difference. Uh, uh, in, um, uh, uh, yeah, in OECD countries, Norway is actually very similar to most uh, European countries, so it's, it's not very much variation in Europe on this, on this dimension. Uh, so in Norway, repeat offenders are punished more harshly for subsequent offenses. Uh, and when it comes to employment interaction, you, don't, you do not have to disclose your criminal record on job applications, with some exceptions in, when working with children uh, and in law enforcement and so on. Uh, you might, of course, lose your job when going to prison, like I showed you for some of the results, uh, so, which could give you a gap in, in your resume and so on. So, could still have effects, but it's very different from having to show it. Uh, and when it comes to government support upon release, you have a lot of programs also for work training, job search, and social support upon entry, uh, but more dispersed and, and uh, not as targeted as when you are in, in prison. Uh, so just to kind of uh, compare them a little bit to, to other countries. Uh, so uh, it's so, some, some pushed back when we did the research that Norway seems to be a big outlier. And that's not really the case. Uh, the US is a big outlier when it comes to prison systems and how many they incarcerate and so on. And Norway is actually uh, not that very different, but, uh, at least when you think about uh, other European uh, countries. Uh, so mass incarceration, like I showed you before, is a recent US kind of phenomenon. It's very, no other countries in the world have this type of rates uh, that they have. Um, and in the US, this kind of very high rates is mo mostly due to very long prison stays. Uh, so again, the marginal uh, inmate and crime is not that different. They, they don't have seven times as much crime as Europe. They have the same type of crime. They just incarcerate them very long. And incarceration means something different also in most other OECD countries than, for example, the US. Uh, so most European countries would have very humane prison conditions. You would, they would have some education and training programs, short sentences, and more reintegration support. But there is a lot of variation in Europe, so it would be nice to, to see more research on, on the European uh, context. Uh, and it's fair to say that Norway in the upper end of focus on rehabilitation and reintegration support also within OCD, I think, yeah. Uh, so Norway has already been used as a model a little bit in, especially in the US. Uh, so they're, they're both the New York Times and The Guardian and others have picked up on the Norwegian model uh, and showed a little bit uh, how the prison system can be designed uh, uh, such that we can better reintegrate uh, 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 inmates into the into the society. Um, okay. 
things if I have. So if them. Yes, so the last part now, uh, I was thinking about so, um, kind of giving you some uh, some pos potential lessons that can be learned from the from the Norwegian, especially the Norwegian um, uh, case, uh, to think about how other countries could um, better in integrate former inmates uh, uh, into the society. Uh, and I think um, uh, th this will differ a lot based on the country and the systems uh, that the country has. Um, and one thing that is important is kind of this cost of rehabilitation. Uh, uh, and most of the uh, differences in the cost of the prison system that I showed before it was due to the labor cost, which actually means that the rehabilitation cost is not that high. Uh, so it's not clear that, um, uh, uh, that it has to be a lot more spending to, to kind of get a better system for rehabilitation. Uh, and just a few thinking, so how can we kind of design these systems to, to not use that much more of the budget? I think that's important for, for many countries. And in the US, uh, you have very costly long prison sentences. Uh, so shortened prison sen sentences could save a lot on the labor costs in particular. And here there is a lot of scope to reallocate, for example, then to rehabilitation programs. Uh, it's not clear that this is a big margin in Europe. Uh, in, if anything in Europe, uh, it, it's some evidence showing that it could be better to increase the length a little bit so that they get better access and a little bit more time in their programs. Uh, uh, but in Europe, I think an alternative is to lower security uh, and save on labor costs on that margin and allocate resources to rehabilitation programs and move to these more open prison uh, models. Uh, not for everyone, but for more than may maybe one third uh, could be like an, a number to, to follow. Uh, so what, what do I back that? Uh, that uh, kind of argument with. Uh, so I think there, I, I, I could only find two papers, uh, which I already mentioned before. So I think we find uh, in the work for Norway, larger effects for open prisons with more focus on rehabilitation. Uh, but this is not very strong uh, causal effects of the, of the open model, uh, but it's very consistent with the, the evidence from Italy that I, that, uh, that I talked about uh, before. And these open prisons are not more expensive per prisoner. If anything, the, the, some, some statistics I found from, from Statistics Norway show that they were uh, cheaper per prisoner. Uh, uh, so open prisons are more expensive because they have fewer prisoners uh, for the in the same facilities and because they have more rehabilitation programs. But, but it's much uh, cheaper because they have uh, fewer staff and in total it's cheaper. Uh, it's, of course, a trade-off with type of prisoners and seriousness of crime committed. Um, and the model likely rely on a kind of a trustworthy society. Uh, it's not, at least, I think that's an important research to think about whether it will, would work in all countries uh, to have this more open. Because it's quite a lot of trust for the prisoners that, that they don't uh, kind of run away. Because it's quite open and it's very easy to, uh, to live. Uh, a kind of related point to open prison is uh, electronic monitoring. So this has gained a lot of popularity as an alternative to prison time for low-level crimes. And this is often for the population that is employed before, because now they can continue to work uh, uh, as before and maybe serve their sentence at home or, uh, or something like that. Uh, uh, there is a little bit of literature on this that show positive effect on recidivism. Um, uh, and it's not clear that this is the same uh, populations that, for example, we study in our work. So it's kind of more overlap with the employed individuals, so we did not find this reduction in crime than with the, the, the non-employed, that they usually would not use electronic monitoring. And in the period that we studied, that I showed you most of our evidence, they, there was not electronic monitoring as an option in Norway. So that's why I don't have any effects in my setting. But I think it's an uh, interesting alternative. Uh, I think one, way, one thing that is important to think about then is whether they also lose access to a lot of the programs that might be important for, for some. So it's not clear that it will have the same effect for, for all, uh, for everyone. Um, so another uh, kind of 
uh, policy or uh, to think about was the kind of the other side. How do we absor absorb the, the, the inmates? So here we can think about flexibility in the, in the labor market. Uh, so I told you that criminal records are not disclosed on most job applicants in, in Norway. And this is not true in, the, in all European countries and the US. So there is variation across states in the US and there is variation across uh, countries on how this is, uh, works out. Uh, and we could think that it's, imp it's a positive to, to have this, but there is also some researches, research that show that they have unintended negative consequences. Uh, and this is uh, because, uh, for example, it was introduced in some states in the US, uh, this ban the box policy, which was that you could no, could no longer, you, were not, you should not, no longer disclose your criminal record. And what happened then was that employers started to um, disproportionately not employ black and young males because they were afraid that they could be criminals, but they, they didn't have a signal anymore, so they couldn't signal them out, so then they stopped employing them. So it had a negative effect on, on the population that usually commits crime and, and go to prison. Uh, so that's kind of what I mean by an unintended consequence. And uh, so it's not always easy to think about how to uh, design such... Uh, such policies. Uh, uh, on the insurance and welfare policies, uh, many countries actually deny access to ex-convicts to parts of the welfare services and so on. And that might make it harder to reintegrate into society. And I think it may probably makes sense to offer programs, work training, job search and social support. Uh, and even in Norway, most resources go to, uh, to the time they are in prisons. Uh, so there is scope here to also improve, I think, on, on the other side. And, and there, uh, I think that's very few countries have a kind of a very fixed good program for this that I could find or lots of research on this. Uh, yeah. So then at the end, I have a few policy proposals I think uh, different countries could um, consider given kind of what we, have, what we know. Uh, uh, and one of these is to shorten prison sentences. Uh, so you could reduce average prison length. Uh, and there are many different ways to do this. You could change mandatory minimum penalties, consider alternatives to prison, such as electronic monitoring, uh, and um, reduce inmates' uh, sentences and so on. Uh, and this is especially relevant in the US, like I mentioned uh, before. Uh, and second, I think you could improve prison conditions and prisoner safety. Uh, for example, reduce the inmate to staff ratio and eliminate overcrowding. Um, increase separation of hardened criminals from low level offenders and follow more the open uh, prison model. Uh, thirdly, I think you could increase funding for job training, education and drug treatment programs. Um, uh, there is usually more demand for this uh, than supply in most countries. Um, you could impose a mandatory requirement to participate in these type of programs, like we have in Norway. Uh, and you could have more resources to improve mental health. Uh, so in different services, I didn't mention this before, but in different services we have in the US and in different European countries, as much as two-thirds to 80% of, of inmates have a mental health issue or problem. Uh, so it's really high prevalence. Uh, so this is something that needs to be uh, 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 ha have priority, I think, and, and needs to be thought about how to design, how to really help them with that, that. because that is an important determinant, likely, of your uh, ability to work and, and participate in, in society. Uh, and finally, which I don't have a lot to say because I didn't find a lot of research on it or haven't looked at it myself, but I think it, there are, is a lot of scope to expand post-release uh, programs. Uh, and promising strategies could be to uh, have more support services like housing, employment, uh, substance abuse, cognitive behavioral therapy, kind of have these programs also outside prison. How to get them to actually attend this is an open uh, question. Uh, and and left for future work. So the, I, I've mentioned this before, but just to have a summary of that. So I think uh, the uh, cost side of it 
uh, it, this doesn't have to be daunting for, for many countries because I think you could save a lot uh, on security and stuff if you implement some of these policies. Uh, so if you have more open prisons and more rehabilitation uh, programs, you could reduce length to save cost or you could uh, reduce stuff uh, inmate ratios. Uh, uh, a side point would be that positive effects of rehabilitation could also reduce the cost of future crimes, increase the tax base if they ent enter employment and so on. So you could, there is also a positive kind of um, uh, uh, government uh, uh, tax base coming from uh, more uh, investments in uh, rehabilitation. So just to conclude, uh, I've say, uh, said everything, but in the Norwegian context, I think prisons can, or we have shown that prison can help to successfully reintegrate former inmates into the society. Uh, different countries face different issues with their prison systems, um, and several components of the Norwegian model could likely be adopted uh, to think about getting a better system and reintegrate uh, inmates better to, to society. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, for this uh, talk, uh, Katrin. Like, um, so I would open uh, the floor to questions. Uh, I, you know, I would start with with one that we got uh, online from Giovanna Nicodano because uh, she asked uh, several minutes ago, uh, and it's related to the to the first research. She asked, uh, "I wonder whether there is an effect of incarceration separate from the one on job training um, among the ones that were not incarcerated? Were there some?" who got uh, job market training anyway. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's what we, we do, do not see that, uh, so no, almost no one attend job market training if they were not incarcerated. Uh, so that's a little bit puzzling in the sense that uh, they could because there are alternatives uh, in outside prison, but they don't attend it. So that's a little bit what I kind of touched upon a little bit later in the talk, that it's really hard to get this population to, to enter these type of programs if it's outside of the institutions. It could be that there are other institutions than prison that could work, uh, but at least uh, we, did, we don't have it yet. So, uh, so I think, yeah, it, to speculate, you could think that institutions like, um, uh, like uh, school or education institutions or uh, even military institutions and so on could have some of the same structure around it. Uh, but if they are open, if it's like no enforcement, enforcement, it seems to be really hard, at least in this context, to, to have them so just offering doesn't help. And, and in prison, you cannot separate the, the two things because you don't have random assignment to training programs, I guess, right? So you... Exactly. So we only see, we see like bigger effects if you have more access. Uh, so we can split the sample a little bit, but we, 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 we don't have random assignment to, to train. Mm. So they're, they're bringing the microphone. I would, like, I would like to ask you if you have uh, done some research about the UN Rehabilitation Centers or are you willing to do some research about that, about them and uh, whether, I don't know, if the schools uh, in prisons help uh, the, um, these uh, young um, uh, prisoners to, in their future. Could you just repeat the first? The center? No. The juvenile detention center. Yeah. Reasons for young. The juvenile. Oh, juvenile. So, sorry, I missed that word. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we don't have the precision to only look at the very young. Um, uh, but, but we did try to split by, by age, and we found that effects, if anything, were a little bit stronger for first time offenders and the younger <laughs> kind of inmate population. But the average is 30 years, and because you don't send much of the young. Uh, Maybe a good thing, but you don't send the juveniles that much to prison in Norway, and we don't have that big populations at the US, so it's really hard in the Norwegian context to look at, at least with this method, to look at uh, juveniles. Um, so we, yeah, I don't have a lot to say, other than the, 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 the evidence is consistent with effects also for the young uh, population. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. Uh, I never thought I would feel like spending a period of time in prison myself, I mean, improving employment chances, mental health, 
<coughs> you make no distinction of type of crime. Um, so everything is flat in your world. And uh, so that's quite striking. Is it because you think it doesn't matter? Uh, or why, why is it that you make no distinction? But wait, I'll make, I'll, I'll make another one connected question. Then you, uh, uh, is that mm, there is some research showing that it depends very much your recidivism on, on your community where you get out, where do you go? <clears throat> so if you, have a, uh, if you are integrated in a community of crime, uh, then you may be more inclined to recidivism. There is a study by a man called David Kirk on, uh, that used uh, uh, Hurricane Katrine to show that <clears throat> there was a difference for if you came out to a community that was wiped out by the hurricane or to a community that was not. So that was an, a nice study. But uh, in Italy, for instance, uh, when some criminals get out of prison, there is a party and uh, there are fireworks. Uh, so uh, that's a, you know that's heterogeneous with respect. So it, dep it depends on the community and the type of crime, I think. Thank you. Thank you for very, very good comments. Uh, so on the type of crime, we, we have done uh, analysis on that. We, got, we, we do think it could matter, and it does matter a little bit, but surprisingly not that much in, in our context. So we actually did find positive effects uh, going through this employment channel, both for violent crimes, uh, drug-related crimes, and property crimes, which are the three biggest uh, type of crimes uh, that we had in our sample. Um, so we didn't find a lot of heterogeneity by type of crimes. For the health effects, it seems that violent crimes, the, the, those that had done violent crimes, had a little bit bigger effects uh, on health, but not again, not uh, to the extent that they were driving the, the effects. Uh, so it, yeah, we, we found that this rehabilitation may, may, is not that different for different type of crimes. So I don't know if that's surprising or not, but that's what we found at least. Uh, I, I, I haven't thought a lot about that, uh, the, the, where you go after, so it's, it's an interesting uh, 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 mechanism to think about when you think about uh, society. And in Norway, you would typically also be free to move where you want, so you don't have a placement, uh, you don't place people after prison. But, uh, um, so it likely a lot go back to their former life, but uh, uh, yeah, that's a, it's an interesting, uh, we could maybe even look at whether, where they where they go and things like that. So that's, uh, that would be interesting, but I haven't looked at it. So. Um, <laughs> it's a good question. So um, uh, how do I answer that? So I don't think in the same degree as in Italy, for example, which is probably a much bigger uh, part, but uh, uh, we have uh, a, a, um, uh, we have looked a little bit at that by looking at how much crime uh, is uh, done uh, together. At, uh, if you have like an, a charge that is like the same crime uh, or co-offending. Uh, and then we see that about 10% of the crime that's committed is together. Uh, so in that sense, there is networks and people do commit crime together. Uh, but we, we, and, and there are some white collar crime and some big uh, robbery and things happening uh, in the Norwegian. But it's... It's, the numbers are not very big, so it's hard to do a study on that in the, in the Norwegian context. Hmm. I have one more question, a question from uh, Giovanna Nicodano. She's asking whether um, once the incarcerated get released, whether they behave like the non-incarcerated ones. So are they fully rehabilitated? I mean, do they become like the average <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, guy or, or not? Uh, on labor market outcomes, for example, or something like that. Uh, so I think they are still behind, but I haven't, that's a, it's a good, uh, we haven't compared to um, the levels of a kind of a general population. So maybe that could be an interesting um, thought. Uh, my guess from remembering doing that work would be that they would still be behind. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, that's an interesting thought. Hmm. Thank you, Catherine, for a very inspiring talk. And uh, also for, uh, I think it's very important for uh, the current situation in terms of uh, increase of uh, right-wing parties and uh, populism, because your uh, results 
obviously have a very clear implication in terms of, um, yeah, as you mentioned, uh, policies regarding incarceration and uh, prisons. Because the first slide that you put on the introduction, I was very, it was, I was very impressed because you said among the pros for uh, having prisons at all, you mentioned rehabilitation, deterrence, and among the cons, uh, human capital depreciation, employment, discrimination, etc. But I was very striking by the fact that you didn't mention what most people, especially in light of this increase of uh, populism and right-wing party, most, most people would say that you know, among the pros of incarceration, there is that actually you can punish. And that is the main motivation for, I uh, think, the US system. So there is a basic difference between uh, the system that, of course, has strong roots in the political system and in the society. But I think, in particular, your results are very important because you find that in terms of uh, um, recidivism and deterrence, you find that there is actually, with the Norwegian system, a, a positive effect for the society if you reduce the length of stay, if you increase the quality of prison, etc. But my question is more about, and, and this of course has to do with safety, which is the big word, no? if we look at these uh, political issues and punishment. But I was wondering uh, to what extent uh, you know, your policies, uh, suggestions could actually be at all considered if uh, uh, the society is actually a completely different goal for uh, incarceration. Thanks. Well, I think that's a very interesting question. And I, I, uh, refer, I did not want to put punishment in the slides just because it's very, it's in the Norwegian, we don't think a lot about that in the Norwegian context, but I, I agree. So that's of course a policy rationale in the US and also in some European countries. And, and it's, um, I think it's important uh, to think about it. Uh, and um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, 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 I do think it's there in Norway too. It's like, it's still like important for the public to, to have prisons and to have this uh, punishment. So it's not clear that it's not at all. Uh, and it's n still a lack of freedom to have people in prison. So it's not, even though you have a rehabilitation and a positive kind of um, effort on that part, you still take away the freedom of, of people. So I think normatively it's a, still an important question. Uh, I don't think we can speak to it with the research that I discussed that much today, because this was more on the margin of a fixed prison population. What can we do? <laughs> uh, and whether you should uh, 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 change the prison population and how much prison you should use and so on. It's, uh, yeah, I, I don't think it can speak a lot to that. I think it's uh, an interesting uh, uh, avenue to, to look at. Uh, you said before that uh, actually the unemployment rate decreases after prison. Uh, does that mean in some way that uh, prisons help more than uh, uh, normal welfare policies in uh, uh, inserting unemployed people into the labor market? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I yeah, I think it's hard to compare exactly because I, I, the employment margin here is going from, it's not necessarily from unemployment, it could be from out of the labor force too, which is the case for a lot of these. Uh, uh, so, so, and it, like, like I said, it, it doesn't seem that a training or help uh, outside of prison made them work more. Uh, so, so in that sense, yeah, I, I would say yes to your question that it seems that prison was the time that, that really helped them to, to join the, the labor force. Uh, but it doesn't mean that it cannot work, and for another population, it, of course not. So, so that's for this specific <laughs> inmate population. Uh, mm. Thank you for your presentation. Um, so I think at some point you suggested that um, incarceration had a deterrence effect on future crimes, right? But also, uh, 
at the end, you mentioned that usually um, countries have um, different um, charges for former convicted. So I was wondering how you could disentangle this different in the scheme of incentives, let's say in the threats, um, from the actual effect of the rehabilitation program. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so I don't think we can perfectly um, uh, um, distinguish this in the work. I think uh, a deterrence effect in our work would be, it's a little bit uh, strange to think about the deterrence effect um, being very different for those that were employed and non-employed before. Uh, so you saw this clear pattern that those were the non-employed started the job market training, then joined employment, and then did less crime. So if the crime effect was only to the deterrence effect, why do you see it for this population and not for those that were previously employed? Uh, so that's like one, one way to think that rehabilitation or the job market training really seem to be an important mechanism for the recidivism effect in this setting. Uh, but... Uh, but uh, I think you could probably have stories where you say that deterrence could be different for different uh, populations and maybe that's correlated with employment status. Uh, so I, I don't think you can fully rule that out. I think there is other research that has shown by, by G1 and others that have shown really interesting work on more on the deterrence effect, specific deterrence effect, uh, uh, and that, that is an important uh, mechanism too. So it's, it could be here too, but, it's, but, but it, it cannot be the only one. That's my... Uh, uh, yeah, that's one way to, s to look at it. Mm. All right, I think uh, we finished the, the questions. Thank, thank you for answering all these qu many questions. And uh, I think we questions. have some uh, refreshments outside. And uh, thank you again.